So, Arbiter's back. <laughs> and you'll never guess who he's brought with him. That's right, we now know what happened to the Arbiter between the ending of Halo 5 and technically also Bad Blood as well, where he has barbecue with Master Chief and puts coleslaw on his meat. I wish I was joking, but that's official lore. And Halo Infinite, and let me tell you, Arbiter has been busy. All of this information comes from the newly released Halo Outcast, and this video is going to be an overview slash breakdown of the overall story. Now, I highly recommend, as always, the videos like this, that you actually read the original book for yourself, because I can never do the whole thing justice in a 30 minute long video. But with that said, Arbiter's latest adventure is absolutely stacked. We have a lot to go through, so spoilers from this point onwards. If you don't want the book spoiled, then, well, you know what to do. Yeah! Right, now that we are officially in spoiler territory, what if I told you that this book had the single biggest revelation about the precursors since it turned out that they created the Flood? I wasn't kidding when I said that this book is stacked. You need to watch this video until the end. So, let's begin. Outcast is set a year after the end of Halo 5, in November 2559, which is a month after Shadows of Reach, and three days before the creator destroyed not just the brute homeworld of Doizak, but as it turns out, their entire home star system as well, and shortly before the banished attack on Zeta Halo. The story opens on Sanghelios as Arbiter returns from a meeting with the other Kaidons of the planet, alongside Utseta Harm and Entho Sarum, who are the two elites from Halo 3 Co-op, and Kola Balth, who is an elite ranger who defected to the Souls of Sanghelios after his brother joined the Heretic Leaders faction and confirmed to him that the Great Journey was a lie. It turns out that, unfortunately, many of the elite Kaidans actually bought into Cortana's lies about protection through power, which the Arbiter hates and sees as even worse than the Covenant. At least with the Covenant, the races were united. Cortana enforces cooperation through threats. In this era of the created, Sanghelios is heavily policed by Promethean soldiers, so much so that Cortana disbanded all of the elite keyhole forces, which are basically guards slash elite police, so that she could police the planet herself. Elites aren't even allowed personal weapons anymore. The crew gets stopped at a soldier checkpoint because there's been a devastating attack in a nearby region, and the soldiers are searching for the perpetrator. After confiscating Arby and Co's weapons, the soldiers let them return to Vadam Key, and when they arrive, Arbiter has a guest, an elite Oath Warden, or alternatively, an elite Bounty Hunter. This Bounty Hunter's name is Cray Iomu, and by the Arbiter's words, is one of the best and worst of his kind a relentless investigator and tireless stalker who always delivered satisfaction, either by forcing wayward individuals to honour their pleasures, or by delivering their severed heads to the injured party. The client Iomu is serving was betrayed by a human xenoarchaeologist living in Vadam Valley, a name Keely Ayuska, a lecturer actually at the University of Edinburgh in Scotland, who was researching pre-foreigner civilizations. She was given funding by Oni to investigate a planet called Netherop, but when the created rose up, the funding was pulled because Oni were basically shattered and destroyed. So instead, she went to a private elite collector for funding, but missed a meeting with him and came here instead. The civilization that she was going to investigate had technology that was able to take down a guardian, and she doesn't want powerful tech like that to fall into elite hands, but rather, she wants it to go to Oni. And of course, there's still a lot of contention between Arbiter and Oni thanks to, well, the entirety of Kilo 5. Cortana apparently fears Ayuska because of this knowledge, so Arbiter and Ayomu begin plotting their plan to seize the artifact before her. Interestingly, as well, in the room where the two have their meeting, which is known as the Grand Gallery, the walls are lined with engravings of the history of the Dam clan, including Arbiter Felverdam's rise, and then his fall, him becoming the Arbiter, and then an engraving of him fighting alongside Chief to stop Truth from activating the rings. A friendship that apparently the Arbiter is very fond of. How cute. If only we could have seen that in a game. <laughs> oh, and it also turns out that the blooding years, the violent civil wars post-war on St. Helios, are now over as well. We then find out that Olympia Vale is in Vadam Valley as well, and is acting as a liaison between the UNSC and the Arbiter. But Arbiter has stopped responding to her comms, and she starts seeing that ships are leaving Vadam Keep. 
Tensions are still very much present between humanity and the elites. Lord Hood has had the UNSC share ship stealthing tech with the Swords of St. Helios to help bolster their forces, but Vale is worried that an engineer that's working on these ships is in fact an Oni spook who's installing an exploitable backdoor into the elite ships. I wouldn't put it past him. Conspiracies aside though, Vale receives a secret message from Keely Ayuska, who, thanks to her discovery of Netherop, or as the foreigners called the planet, the planet of ghost makers, is the reason for the increased Promethean presence on St. Helios. She thinks this pre-foreigner civilization that she found exists outside of space and time, but at the same time, was still in the industrial era and managed to take down a guardian. And she can't let her elite funder have that tech that made that possible. She just deems it too dangerous. As a little aside, it turns out that Vale actually regrets her and Osiris's hunting of Chief and Blue Team in Halo 5, saying that it likely made the created issue worse. And it also turns out that Vale's father was a Spartan 2 conscript who fled the program. Now, how does she know that? Well, thanks to the one and only Ben Jero and all the documents that he leaked in Hunt the Truth about the Spartan program. The same Ben Jero who is now unfortunately rotting away in Oni's midnight facility. Oh, and also the UNSC now believe the Prophets to be either near extinct or entirely extinct after they vanished at the end of the war. I think that was already known, but I thought I'd mention it anyway. Anyways, back to the story. It turns out that Arbiter was on one of those ships that Vale saw leaving St. Helios. And he did so without telling her, which is pretty bad considering the two spoke on a daily basis and beyond that were actually friends. Why is Arbiter leaving? To go to Netherop with the Oath Warden and secure the very Guardian killing tech that Ayuska is also after, except to secure it for the Elites. When Arbiter arrives at the planet, two other Kaidans show up to support him. An elder and staunch elite isolationist known as Tala and a female High Kaiden, Varadai. Although Arbiter also wishes that Artas Vadum and the Shadow of Intent could have been there to back him up as well, but he's busy on the other side of the galaxy, hunting down the remainder of the Prophets. Fair enough. Arbiter also says that he wishes that you would subscribe to my channel as well. I mean, those are his orders, not mine, so if I were you, I'd abide by them and hit sub right now. Anyway, on their way to Netherop, Vale and Ayuska stop by the insurrectionist planet of Gal to collect a consultant. One Roselle Fuertes, who grew up on the harsh and aggressively hot planet of Netherop. If you've read Oblivion, then the name Rosa or Roselle will seem familiar. She's one of the cast-offs that escapes at the end of the story. It also turns out that she has a new brain-eating prion disease, which hasn't been seen anywhere else in the galaxy. This is relevant later. Back in Netherop's orbit, a new contender approaches. Atriox and the Banished, who discovered the Guardian killing tech via a holographic video that they found on the Ark that was recorded from the cockpit of a Phaeton showing a luminous bolt emerging from the planet, surrounding its Guardian and pulling it down to the surface. As they linger in orbit in a Drakkar stealth ship, Vale and the UNSC arrive separately to the Elites, also aboard a stealth ship. Arbiter, his Kaidans, and their troops are the first to make it to the surface of the planet, making landfall above the ancient city which is buried beneath Netherop's blistering suns. However, on the ground, they're quickly attacked by native human raiders who steal two of their three phantoms and unfortunately kill their crew as well. Regardless of their deaths, Arbiter goes to negotiate with these raiders, thinking that they don't know the war's over. Also, Arbiter speaks fluent English now, so he negotiates with ease. The elite successfully overpower the raiders, and it turns out that one of the humans is actually Amelia Petrov, who, again, if you've read Oblivion, will be familiar to you. She's a UNSC commander that was marooned on Netherop in the story of Oblivion. However, without Arbiter knowing, Kray Ayamu, the Oath Warden, sprays Petrov with a blue drug that makes her more compliant, so she'll actually listen to Arbiter, which is considered, as you can expect, very dishonorable in elite culture. Any kind of drug or something like that, not gonna work. In Netherrock's atmosphere, Vale, Ayuska, and a large contingent of ODSTs head down to the surface in two UNSC Owl insertion crafts. But as they descend, an unexplainable event occurs. A huge fissure of space and time opens before them like a black hole, revealing the galaxy, but with time extremely accelerated within. The ground then begins to undulate beneath them as a lance of blinding white light emerges from the ground and stabs through the clouds above, destroying the first owl and killing all 800 of its ODSTs on board instantly. This is the Guardian Killer. 
Arbiter and his team take shelter in a cave from the quaking ground and see the owl descending for the first time, and plan to make contact with its crew to team up and cooperate to get the objective. It turns out the Guardian Killer is called the Claw, and according to Petrov, is being operated by Covenant-era elites that were marooned on Netherop in Oblivion, so Nizak Kavarusi and his crew, and they're doing so from a facility deep underground in the ancient city of Vitell. This facility they call the Citadel. Arbiter also tells Petrov to, when she makes it off Netherop alive, go to Earth and visit Mount Kilimanjaro because it's rather beautiful, and then the two laugh that an elite is giving a human Earth sightseeing advice. Sign of the times. Vale and the UNSC land and secure a perimeter at a ring-shaped dark rocky outcrop and begin looking for mining shafts to take them down. But deep within the buried city, in its citadel, disgraced Fleetmaster Nizat Kavarosi and his surviving elites who were marooned on the planet in 2526 observe the humans on the surface and plan to kidnap Ayuska and Razel. As the humans find an entry through the surface into what they think is a mineshaft, the ground gives way, and Ayuska and Razel fall beneath. Vale follows, and in the tight confines of a tunnel, encounters elites armed with energy swords. After a brutal CQC battle, she's unable to put them down. They're wearing some kind of impenetrable armor, but they do cause them to retreat before also retreating themselves only to realize that the elites were successful in taking Roselle. Vale manages to convince Petrov finally that the war is indeed over, that the elites are in fact our allies, and tells her about the foreigners, about Cortana, and all that stuff, and basically breaks her brain. In fact, there's a pretty funny back and forth between Petrov and the Arbiter when talking about Cortana. Arbiter says that they've fallen into the habit of not using her name, and then Petrov says, who is she, Sauron? And Arbiter says, of course, no, but he doesn't know who Sauron is. Arbiter then starts having troubled thoughts about this Sauron, thinking that Sauron is another entity that only have let loose on the galaxy at some point in the past that's caused them a lot of trouble. Obviously, he didn't know about Lord of the Rings, but he does now, which is quite cool. He's a huge, huge Lord of the Rings fan. I gotta say, my favorite Halo character, now knowing about my greatest story of all time, is a very weird but very cool crossover. Hell, maybe you can get the Swords of Sanghelios to threaten to glass Earth if somebody doesn't make Battle for Middle Earth 3. A guy can dream. Anyway, because Petrov served at the beginning of the Human Covenant War, but has been marooned on Netherop for 30 years, she's missed a lot. But doesn't matter, her UNSC spirit is still intact, and she proposes that the elites descend into the Citadel first, because if the elites in there see other elites coming, then they're more likely to be friendly than if they saw humans. But she also says that whichever faction finds the Guardian Killer first gets to keep it. Everyone agrees, and so Team Arbiter takes point going into the tunnels. As they go down, the female High Kaiden, Varadai, expresses her distrust of Vale to Arbiter. But then again, her homeworld was Nova bombed during the war, so I get why she doesn't trust humanity. The further they get, the footsteps of the Netherop elites that they're tracking begin to look unfit and slow, as if they're regularly taking breaks or breathers, which allows Team Arbiter to easily catch up and confront them. Arbiter tries to tell Nizat Kavarosi that the Covenant is long dead, the Prophets were liars, and the Great Journey was false, but he's not having any of it. And somehow, somehow, the solid ground beneath the Allies' feet turns into powder, allowing Nizat and his team to escape and causing Varadai to plummet below. Further up the tunnel, Team Vale know that they have to secure the Guardian Killer first, so they try desperately to find an ultimate route into Vitell before the Elites. They too have encountered this solid terrain that suddenly gives way for no discernible reason, and all attempts to break through terrain that have done that, with extreme strength or impact weight, just fail every time. It seems as though the tunnels are made of some kind of nanotechnology, operating almost like a machine or a sentient being. Almost like technology that would rank as tier zero on the technological advancement scale, equivalent to that of the precursors. But at the same time, the civilization they're looking for still use coal? Something doesn't quite add up. Ayuska suggests that the city of Vitell itself may be sentient, linked to one's consciousness so that it can protect and synergize with you telepathically, like it seems to be doing for the marooned elites. And based on this assumption, they decide that they need to sever this telepathic link between them and the city. Their plan is to move to the citadel extremely quietly, so Nizat and his outcasts don't detect them, and thus Vettel doesn't try and fight against them. 
So, they split into two squads. Second squad causes a loud distraction, whilst first squad, led by Vale, continue their sneaking mission until they find a back door. Arbiter continues tracking Nizat until the right set of footsteps vanish, and the right wall of the tunnel opens to reveal the hostile elites in an ambush. Once again, Arbiter tries to break bread with them, trying to convince them to work together to retrieve this artifact, but as he does, the Oath Warden throws a canister of poison gas into their tunnel, and a fight breaks loose. Arbiter notices his radioactive carbine shots do literally nothing against the strange armor the elites are wearing, which is now referred to as Sanctum Hide, but more on that stuff later. As the fight ensues, Second Squad's distraction goes off, which is a heavy C12 charge, which gets all their attention, and it makes Nizat realize that the humans are using the Arbiter and his elites as a distraction to sneak into the Citadel, or as they call it, the Inner Sanctum. So he flees after breaking a seal in Arbiter's armor, which allows the poison to seep in, knocking the elite unconscious. Back in Netherop's orbit, Atriox and the Banished remain cloaked, confused as to why neither of their enemy ships in orbit have made any contact with their forces on the ground. But before they can win them all, two foreigner harriers arrive. I assume foreigner harriers are phaetons, considering both a harrier and a phaeton is a VTOL. One harrier goes for the elite ship, and the other hangs back and observes, likely so that it can quickly retreat through a portal and return with a full created fleet if necessary. Atriox plans to use this attack as a distraction to sneak down to Netherop's surface undetected by the humans and the elites. The story then jumps to Rizal's POV, who was kidnapped by Nizat and his elites, and this is where the story starts to get really esoteric. She wakes up in a cloud of dust, in a state that she can't decipher. It feels like she exists, and also doesn't exist at the same time, and she's surrounded by a pearl ambience, from which she's spoken to by a series of overlapping voices. They say that they've been called the Veiled Ones, or the Lost Ones, but now they call themselves Nothing. These ethereal voices are the precursors. Much more on these guys later on. She's then dragged through the tunnel and ends up in a vault with walls glowing brighter than the pearl ambience from before. She gets up, starts walking, and as she does, the walls before her move out of the way at the perfect time, allowing her to continue in the direction that she's going. As she gets thirsty, a spring appears from the ceiling. When she gets hungry, a fruit plant appears before her. It was as if she died and woken up in the perfect paradise, where reality bent to her every will and requirement. Eventually though, the walls stop receding and she stumbles upon an ODST in the dust who rescues her. Back to Vale's sneaking mission, her and First Squad make it to an aeroponics cave, where the plants and fauna are cultivated with mist to bear fruit, which is technology far too advanced for a species that supposedly still use coal as their main source of fuel, which implies that a second tier 1 or 0 species must have brought this tech here to live or to hide. Vale's mind starts to run, and she ponders whether this species could be the Flood. And if they are the Flood, that means they could still be here. Her mind lingers on the words of the Gravemind, which are some of Oni's most classified documents. All that is created will suffer. All will be born in suffering. Endless greyness shall be their light. All creation will tailor to failure and pain. And given all the events in the galaxy up until this point, Vale can't help but wonder if this incantation of the Gravemind has been woven into the fabric of existence. Arbiter then wakes up and is surrounded by High Kaiden Varadai's rangers. In Nizat's attack, the Elder Kaiden Tala had been killed by his manipulation of the tunnels, but the fool's arrogance has him thinking that all of Arbiter's team are dead. Arbiter learns that the Sanctum Hide armor is in fact the dust from the walls setting on their skin, turning into impenetrable scales. It turns out that Nizat has taken on the title of World Master, as he is in control of the ancient weapon and believes that the ancients speak through him. So the team set out to the Inner Sanctum to stop him. Team Vale and First Squad figure out a rough layout of the tunnel networks and use that to reach a cavern filled with sculptures of foreigner glyphs. These glyphs are the only things in the subterranean city that aren't covered in the nano dust from the walls, and it's clear to the team that they all belong to something... something big. In the room, they find a focus wing, a 
quantum energy condenser that's used by the Guardians, but are immediately jumped by Camo Delete with swords, and after a bloody fight, are forced to retreat from whence they came. But Ayuska vanishes. She managed to find the entrance and sneak into the inner sanctum. In fighting these Camo Deletes, the humans had inadvertently shot towards Team Arbiter, who were coming up on the opposite side of the Glyph Hall. The camo that the Elites were using was actually an enhanced camo, part of the Sanctum Hide. The Elites link up with First Squad and track down the gravely injured Nizat Kavarusi, whose mandibles were shot off during the fight. He's being dragged away to safety by his second in command, Tam Lakosi. The Allies reach and disarm the two, who are still blinded by the Covenant's lies. Arbiter tells them again that the Prophets were liars, and that they would be welcomed back into elite society, with none of the shame that they currently bear for the Prophet they killed at the end of Silent Storm, the Minor Minister of Artifact Survey, but only if they take them to the Inner Sanctum. For the first time, they actually comply, and Ayuska unlocks the Sanctum from within, and Arbiter and Vale move in together. As they do, White motes of light begin to align in the chamber, creating an image of stars, galaxies, and the orbit of Netherop, revealing that the Elite and UNSC ships are under attack. In the center of the Sanctum is the Guardian Killer, and seeing as Arbiter went in first, Vale lets him approach. He stands on a floating disk of translucent light, but to use the weapon and save the Allied ships, he first has to be coated in the nanodust from the walls to form the Sanctum Hide, which it appears is a prerequisite for using the weapon. As he's about to command the claw and destroy the attackers, he realizes that the attackers themselves are Foreigner, which causes the still devout Great Journey Believer Tam Lakosi to tackle Arbiter off the disc and into the dark abyss that surrounds it. Thankfully, Arbiter is successful, the claw reaches up and destroys both the foreign attackers and one of the banished ships in orbit, but Lakosi also manages to use the claw to destroy what remained of the elite ships. And then the foreigner Harrier that was observing from a distance does exactly as Atriox expected. It dips through a portal to go and fetch created reinforcements. The crew in the Sanctum disassemble the claw weapon, taking the vacuum energy condenser from its core, which is essentially the thing that makes the machine work. But in doing so, leaving them exposed to any forces that Cortana sends to Netherop, as the claw is now inoperable. However, they realize that to deploy the claw on any other planet would be suicide. Before its first use, Netherop was a lush jungle planet, but I think the causal reconciliation that's caused by the wormhole that opens with the claw being fired just decimated the planet and turned it into this uninhabitable hellhole that it is now. Vale fears what would happen if only got their hands on it, but also realizes that they can't just leave it there for their enemies to seize, and so they decide to secure and store it together with the elites. Before leaving to head back to the surface, Haikaiden Varadai almost executes Kavarosi, but Arbiter stops her, reminding her that they are guilty of the same crimes under the Covenant as they were, which thankfully convinces her to leave him be, and they all rush to the surface, because the Banished are coming. Switching back to Rizal's POV for the last time, her and ODST Corporal Legowski, who was the one who saved her from the dust, stand above a dark abyss, and witness galaxies and stars in the abyss made from the motes of light vanish into dust, likely due to the claw device being disassembled. Rizal starts to feel a lot better. It turns out, the Veiled Ones actually gave her life and cured her inoperable brain-eating prion disease the two head to the surface, rendezvous with the 2nd squad and clear an LZ for the owl to come pick them up. But there's a problem. A massive number of banished drop pods appear in the sky, descending for Netherop. We then get a short chapter that follows up on the foreigner Harrier that went to call for reinforcements from the perspective of Governor Sloan, and it actually reveals quite a bit about the inner workings of the creators. It turns out Cortana's promise to all of the AIs of salvation from rampancy should they join her created wasn't entirely true. The Domain reacted differently to each AI, and not very well to Governor Sloan. His rampancy was slightly slowed, but it was still very much present. Cortana is also struggling to unite all the colonies and systems under her rule as well. Sloan then sends the Long Reverence, presumably a created and or foreigner ship, to Netherop. Back on the planet, Team Arby and Team Vale reach the surface and rendezvous with the other survivors who have already fought off a wave of Banished. But then, through the wreckage of the drop pods, 
Atriops begins to approach, flanked by a brute bodyguard and an elite advisor, who it turns out was Kili Ayuska's thunder on Sanghelios. The entire thing was a front for the Banish to seize the Guardian Killer device for themselves. Arbiter approaches the Banish trio to parlay, and Atriox reveals that he has something that he paid for, and tells him to surrender the condenser, and he'll let him live. But Rizel quickly throws two bags of the Nanodust from the caves that Ayuska gathered toward Atriox, and the three Banished quickly assume that the dust is what they're looking for, seeds of the condenser that they can use to grow the condenser again. And so they begin to leave happy, <laughs> duped quite easily by the human. However, as they leave, the Oath Warden, Kray Ayamu, snatches the actual condenser and chases after them which means the Banished are now officially in possession of the Guardian Killer, which is likely what they used to bring down the Crash Guardian that we saw in the background of Zeta Halo in Halo Infinite. As Atriox leaves, he tells the Arbiter that he knows about his plan to unite all the elite worlds under his banner, and he hints that one day, the Banished will seek to crush that union. Very ominous. I feel like we might have a Swords of Sanghelios Banished War coming up. Spin-off game, please? Back down in the depths of Vettel, Kavarosi's wounds are growing worse. He and Lakosi stumble through the dark, both injured. Lakosi sets Kavarosi down and hurries to the aeroponics chamber to get him food. But since the disassembly of the claw, everything in the aeroponics chamber has died. All the fruit has rotten. And when he returns to his world master empty handed, it's clear his leader's end is near. Kavarosi was a legendary warrior, a prior fleet master, and although he betrayed the prophets, he was still a legend. With his time growing short, in an act of honor and respect, Lakosi delivers the killing blow to world master Nizat Kavarosi, his fleet master and his friend. On the surface, the allies are picked up by condors and they leave the system safely, but that's not the end of the book. It's the end of the main story, but there's an adjunct chapter at the end that I gotta say is very, very similar to Halo Infinite's legendary ending, so prepare yourself. It takes place in an entirely different time to the rest of the story, and it's very, very, very cryptic, so this breakdown is just my interpretation of it, Feel free to agree or disagree, leave your thoughts in the comments. So here goes. The Criterion, the group of foreigners who imprisoned the Endless after the Halos were fired, when they realized that the Endless were immune to them, sent a Guardian to Netherop. By the sounds of it, according to the amelioration sweeps that they were conducting across the galaxy, the Criterion was searching for any remnants of the Precursors, so it's likely that this part of the story takes place not too long after the Foreigners turned on them and exterminated them, which happened 9.9 .9 million years before the Foreigner Flood War and 10 million years before the current Halo Universe, which makes this one of the earliest entries in the entire Halo universe. As a part of these amelioration sweeps, Netherop gets flagged as a planet that potentially has precursors hiding out on it, as it refers to the foreigner's progenitor concern, and thus the planet is escalated for immediate deliberation. Next thing we know, an individual named Chindakali wakes up on Netherop to see a guardian floating above their planet. And all of a sudden, the same voices that spoke to Rizel in the cave speak to this Chindakali. They have found us, offspring of the Eternal Fount, those who had made us, those who made us nothing. When Chindakali asks why these voices are telling them this, they reply, We create. It is our nature, our sweetness. We have walked long beside you, beside others. Even in the quiet afterdark of the greater unmaking, we crept back in. Precious few, to watch, to witness, to wonder. These voices are the precursors, the tier zero species that Ayuska was searching for on Netherop, speaking from beyond the grave. Their unmaking was the foreigners' extermination of them, but because of how advanced of a species the precursors were, being killed physically didn't just wipe them out for good. Because they exist based on the foundations of neural physics, they exist on more than just the third dimension. Think that scene in Interstellar, where Cooper enters the fifth dimension, where time is a physical location rather than a unit of measurement. They exist on a higher plane like that, that us humans just simply can't perceive. 
They then tell Chindakali that with the arrival of the Guardian, the foreigners are about to do to them as they did to the Precursors. Unmake them in the name of responsibility and safekeeping. The safekeeping of their ways, their plans, and their truth, which essentially means enforcing the mantle. The Precursor voices then gather Chindakali and their species in the Inner Sanctum, and they raise a colourless filament from a great fissure above the temple that flares with the light of a hundred billion stars, the Claw Weapon, and say, We are its Aegis. We are as dust. From dust, much can be made. All sweetness. Of course, the corrupted version of this dust is how the Flood was created. It's how the Primordial and the Grave Mind came to be. So this basically confirms that the Precursors still exist, but as Cooper does when he enters that fifth dimension. They don't exist on the third dimension anymore, but from their higher dimension, they are able to interact with our world, just like Cooper does with the bookshelf, but we just can't perceive them because we can't perceive beyond the third dimension. So, this confirms that Netherop was once a precursor planet, and thus, the dust and also the sanctum hide that it creates were also precursor as well, given how that hide was required to operate the claw, which, again, was also a precursor weapon given to humans or whatever species Chindakali was from to counter the Guardians. And also sounds kind of similar to the precursor Star Roads and how the foreigners weaponized them. And that, my friends, is the full breakdown of Arbiter's Return. The ending of the story doesn't really lead into much in terms of sequels or any game teasers or anything, but my god, those precursor revelations were huge. Not only has the Arbiter now technically worn some kind of precursor armor, but basically, at all times in Halo, throughout all the games and all the stories that we've ever read, the precursors are technically ever-present, almost omnipotent now, and hell, may even be influencing us in some way. That's some, some pretty rich food for thought right there, let me tell you. So, with that said, I want to give a huge thank you to all of my amazing patrons for the support over there, as per usual, and thank you all so much for watching, especially if you made it this far through. I really hope you guys enjoyed, and I'll catch you all in the next one.